A few Cinema Coffee Fashion Fridays ago, I mentioned the term mom and I film, and I do talk about my mom's fashion sense a lot on top of the countless comments I receive about her regularly. So thought this week I dedicate this Cinema Cafe as a special addition to my mom, who is never far from my thoughts daily, and you hear me speak of her often, but want to spend this coffee talk with the reminders, the lasting imprints that are around me every day for my mom. To the break room classic film fans, it's tea time for a coffee break. Can you get Cab Calloway on it? By the way, how is your father? But I want to know. Does it bother you? All right, so I have a lot of things that I want to share with you guys today. So I'm going to get the coffee out of the way from the beginning. <laughs> you guys, if you've been with me long enough, you know my story with co coffee and fabrics. And no, it just, it's not a good look. A native Louvillian, as my dad too, growing up, she was second youngest of seven six girls, one boy, and because of being one of the youngest, she often said it gave them, as the younger two, the advantage of sneaking into the older sister's closet, particularly my Aunt Geneva, who was probably the most in vogue sister of the eldest here, and two, because my mom had yet to be allowed to wear such grown-up clothes at the time, which did not derail my mom <laughs> in the least. When I think of fashion sense, I always think of my mom first, middle, and last. Everyone else is in between. It was a treasured moment to hear my mom tell my aunt how she used to sneak into her closet after she'd go off to school and borrow her clothes and try to rush back home before my aunt to return the clothes back to her closet. The look of silence on my aunt's face, I didn't know that. <laughs> is a memory that is priceless to remember. However, it is evident just through photos alone when my mom finally reached her teens into her adulthood throughout the rest of her life, she developed a fashion sense all her own. And soon I'd become the little sister-esque <laughs> protege growing up asking not taking if I could wear some of my mom's clothes to school, which aside from one occasion, a white blouse, she'd give me a firm, no, my clothes are too grown for you. Ultimately leading to she and I having sort of an open closet policy when I hit my young adult years that lasted throughout, where we'd often borrow each other's clothes, shoes, handbags, totes, jewelry. My mom being the only person I'd share my things with over my school friends, because with them, you never knew if you were going to get them back. Yeah, so I started the production of the no borrow policy with friends. My mom was a natural creative, a lifelong creative, mostly self-taught, which always amazed me growing up and continued to amaze me throughout my life. Often asking, especially in my youth, where did you learn to do that? More often than not, met with like a shrug as if sincerely, I don't know, I just a little something I picked up along the way, but not in a snobbish way, but in a genuine, authentic, humble way. She had a true gift, not just a knack for matching and using colors, be it in her artistry as an artist, being a self-taught oil painter, or even decorating what we called crafting, um, even creating her own clothes. In her youth, a cheerleader in high school, I too, a part of that alumni co-curricular activity with orchestra, then ultimately drill team during my last years in high school, later dance in college. I always thought my mom could have easily been a model when looking through her photos of her teenage young adult years. And in fact, she was briefly a model at Chilotoe's department store, a company with a history all its own. I'd often ask, why didn't she pursue it, like make a career out of it? But not only did she not see an opportunity for her during the time, 
for it, I don't think that was an ambition of hers and very much the other way around. Like there's no ambition in a career where there is limited to no opportunity. She did become a licensed beautician attending beauty school, even making her own business out of it in her parents' basement, which she maintained doing hair throughout her life, even when it became strictly just for friends and family on occasion before I became her permanent client weekly on occasion doing a friend or two of mine's hair if I asked her prior to if she felt like she was up to it. I always felt as if I were wearing some sort of badge of sorts. I'm with her whenever we'd go to Sally's, <laughs> my mom and her card, and she'd know more than those who worked there. But painting and decorating really was her ambition. There was never a moment I remember her not painting either for herself or others portraits as an anniversary or a birthday gift, book publications, events, murals. Her work often displayed in galleries when I was growing up. The art shows she'd conduct at her house when I was a kid when the newspapers, something I have one of many, <laughs> when the newspapers were in attendance for me was better than any red carpet event at the Academy Awards, especially when she would be our guest speaker at school when I was a kid to discuss her artwork and seeing the shock on other classmates' faces. Is that your mom? Yep. Here is just one of the books she had with some of the notes and messages she received from my class and others after she was invited to guest speak at schools and classes. I'll have to show you this through camera shots because to turn it, <laughs> turn it up and like to open this to show you would be a delicate matter quite literally as some of the things aren't secured and will no doubt be all over the place. <laughs> so I'll have to share this with you in person. I think I can show you some things already coming out. I think I can show you a few things like some of the newspaper articles. <laughs> some of the newspaper articles that she had and in the front she has in the front some of this stuff is not secured. Some of the pages if you can see it um, of letters and notes that she received from I'm, I'm holding so tight so nothing falls out that she received this is so, this is so mediocre the way I'm doing this. I'm so, I apologize. Um, some of the notes and letters that she received from classmates and other classes in school. So I will show this to you guys. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I will show this to you guys uh, like in, in edit. I guess you could say it didn't occur to me that other moms didn't look like my mom, but it did. I knew my mom was different from the other moms. I knew she was special. She became a stay-at-home mom when I was born who did not look like a stay-at-home mom you'd picture in your mind, however you would, I think, conjure that up. She painted, had meetings, went to meetings when doing book illustrations, showing her latest sketch ideas for story pages. Yes, shopping for the house, constantly dreaming up a certain look, always one step ahead of what was in vogue of home decor. At one point, even doing a few decor jobs for homes, my dad, being the largest black construction owner operator in the city of the time, had contracted. My family and I always worked in some capacity as a team. Our individuality and what we could do individually, our independence in our own field, being the strength that made us whole. Of all the paintings my mom created, and she did enough to fill a gallery, her favorite piece was an oil painting she painted backwards and forwards, the same title I used when I produced my short film after losing my mom for my mom. Reflecting the silence, void, emptiness we all go through when losing someone exclusively that group of us who have lost someone that close unexpectedly as if literally snatched out from under you it's a loss you never fully recover from you just learn to live with it to put it in its place because it's never anything you can make complete, if at all, sense of. She was offered numerous times X amount to sell, but she'd always decline saying, these are the only paintings not for sale. I have been asked many times, as was my mom, if I were the inspiration behind the painting and or if the girl were I. She never hesitated and I never took offense because I was there when she came up with the idea. 
No. Like most of her ideas, it just sparked from somewhere, some internal place. Most of her work represented what she called Black folk art, her motto, logo, slogan, back to basics, as you saw on the binder here. She paints scenes you'd see of a certain time, a certain era, though she'd never date them specifically as in like pinpointing a year, a specific year, or even a decade. They were really of an era and it's up to the viewer to find the date for themselves, like according to how the setting, the style reflected in their eyes. My mom captured a scene for you to identify and place where it goes in your mind, your imagination. She took it as a great compliment when someone would say, that reminds me of their aunt or grandmother or their greats and grands, someone that dated a part of their ancestry. That's exactly the reaction she was looking for when she paint. She also painted portraits upon request and not only book illustrations, <laughs> like for my dad. Here is the original sketch that she came up, came up with for my dad's cover. And this being, I, we have a few of these. This is the book binding, like a demo of the book binding before it actually was bound uh, for the book. So from Rags to Rags, A Man of Many Faces, The Untold Story of Howard Breckenridge. So this is, this is book illustrations by my mom. And also for our family friend who sincerely was more family than friend who has since passed away, Eddie Sarge Stimson, who was an old settler of and from the South, going on to make a career really out of the military. My mom too, a veteran, though not as a career. She was a Vietnam vet army. She was the person who would basically hand out the orders in which the soldiers would be sent to, like where they were going to be sent. Our family friend signing up during the Korean War, then lying about his age to join, spending most of his time across Europe. But my mom painted his stories of stories passed on to him of settlers traveling by wagon, authentically as you would see in a Western, and his own memories, his own eyewitnessed stories captured on canvas. And I'm not gonna show you every single photo because she has a lot of, there's a lot of photos in here that my mom sketched for the book. I'm there, I mean, there really is. There really is a lot. It's This one is called My Remembers of Black Sharecroppers Recollections of the Depression, uh, Eddie Stimson, Jr. Sarge. And then in the front, it was my mom's illustration by Bernie Spreckenridge. So you can see that there with her sketches as well uh, on there. But there's a lot of my mom's work in here that she, that she sketched. I'm in love with it. I'm in love with it. So just to show you, just to show you a few, there's a, there's a lot in here and she also did another, there's Remembers of Moe's. This is another one with um, illustrations by, by my mom. You can see her work here as well in this, in this book. So these are just some of the sketches. Her painting ability was really unlimited. She would go from what she titled window shopping to the settlers, to a jazz scene as was requested. It was a request made of her to paint a jazz scene on the largest canvas she could to line the walls of their homes as jazz was their life's focal point in genre and style. And she, this is, this is like an actual sketch from how she was like picturing it up to to look like um, and it was huge it was it was on a huge canvas she, she did a couple of these but this is just the sketch of what she was trying to conjure up the idea of what the jazz setting should be um, from biblical to sketches my mom's artwork was truly original the same went for her personal style as showcased on the mannequin this being one of the many pieces she created for herself growing up it was a repeated occurrence to see the cutting board and sewing machine out as much as easels, paint, brushes, turpentine. <laughs> it was such a natural occurrence. I didn't think it unusual that everyone wasn't living like this. And yet at the same time, I knew it was something special, unique, distinctive, specifically for us. Whereas my mom's other sisters could quilt, knit, crochet a field all its own, my mom in my eyes was the only one with the talent skill for sewing garments in the length she did, which again, I think stemmed from more trial and error on certain things outside of like her basic home economic, like, wait, is that still, is that even a thing anymore? Is that like a course? anymore? Okay, I don't know. Um, but I don't exaggerate when I say most everything she learned or knew how to do 
was more trial and error, observing, self-teaching, what works, what doesn't work, as I too follow along the lines of, don't give me anything written. I'm not a directions reader. You are wasting your time handing me <laughs> directions because I won't read them. I am visual, visual, visual. Just sit everything down and <laughs> let me figure it out. I don't know if that's a family trait or just being a Gemini, but I'll read books, not directions, which is much like how I learned sewing, which we have discussed on previous Cinema Coffees, like just observing her through the years on what to do. And then whenever I needed help, uh, learning on my own, asking the master, asking the teacher, okay, so now what do we do? Which really evolved into sewing becoming a team effort when I turned it into a business. First started out sketching, then creating with the intent of trying to get my clothes into stores as a fashion line, Dominique Private Collection. And that whole process I began to realize wasn't necessarily what I wanted once I began seeing and networking, communicating on the other side of it, like the other end, seeing the behind the scenes process. So my focus shifted to creating garments for fashion shows, later just shows, not with the intent to sell the clothes or to create the garments to have sold or bought in mass production, but strictly for the show. But why would you have a fashion show and not want to sell your clothes? Because that was just it. I wasn't selling the clothes. I was selling the story told through the clothes, which when I think back to my earliest memories, even as a kid, that was the original idea from the start. It's the settings, the sets, the decor, the style, the garment that told the story for me or inspired a story or scene for me like your most elaborate daydream shown on stage, a theatrical production. It's very, it's very Walter Mitty up here, which is the simplest way I can describe what it is I do theatrical productions. I create clothes to tell a story. It can be a scene or feature length. You give me a theme and I'll create a story, the choreography and the garments. That was how it started for me before attempting to turn my own stories I had written into the theatrical production, all mostly inspired by or influenced by classic cinema, which too is what I do. The more classic cinema I'd watch, the broader the imagination opened up and the easier to see what classic cinema influences had on now cinema. A form of inspiration that also reflected in the relationship between my mom and I. A description when I say we were more like sisters is what I mean by that. Our joint enjoyment of everything that identified us from creating crafting, to baking, shopping, to cinema. Cinema being our strongest connection point, as it was something she'd tell me more than once. I didn't start watching movies, and definitely not classic movies, to the extent I watch them now until you came along. To date, it's one of the best compliments I could receive from my mom, because through her, for me growing up, I knew Sophia Loren, Elizabeth Taylor, Dorothy Dandridge, Lena Horne, Betty Davis, Joan Crawford. I knew the letter, Sunset Boulevard, Springtime in the Rockies. And yet my mom said she wasn't a cinema person. She was though. She knew them because they were there, not to the degree I brought cinema to the table. Bios, docs, commentary, references, timelines, context. And as she told me, she liked it. It became of interest to her. It's our shared love for cinema that I created Cinema Coffee blog pieces after losing my mom to spotlight and share some of our fave films out loud. Films I have the biggest memory of with her, also known as Mom and I films. Camille to Valkyrie, Cast a Dark Shadow 1955, starring Dirk Bogart to Burn After Reading. I'm just Linda Linsky. It would be near impossible to narrow down to one fave film of ours, but one of our biggest film faves as a whole that I have never written a blog piece on because it would be way too much, way, way too much to write, James Bond. I had shot this Cinema Coffee previously to October 31st, and it just didn't make sense to go through, like to upload that video in the wake of losing Sean Connery. Because at the time when I was shooting it, it was more of like still hoping. I think that was one of my mom and I's biggest 
hopes that maybe one day uh, he would show up in a James Bond film, just like, like come out of retirement just for that. And I know it was just wishful thinking, but I, I think when we were in Skyfall, when we went to go see Skyfall, that buildup that we had, like clenching onto each other, you know, the scene, you know, <laughs> when the new 007, when Daniel Craig is, is going into the house, we were like clutching each other's hands thinking maybe this is like the most best kept secret. Like maybe this is something like no one was aware of, like he's going to appear. And although we still got, you know, a part of the classic film family, we still got our, our classic film actor. Um, we were hoping like maybe, maybe we can get Sean Connery into a James Bond just one more time. This is a cameo, which again, I know is wishful thinking. Sean Connery for, for us, for me growing up was way more than just Bond. He may, that may have been an introduction, but that certainly was not the limit. I mean, his films fabricated my film life growing up and a lot of his films just went way beyond for me James Bond. So that was not something I was looking to see. Of course, we never looked to see that. But when I saw that on my phone, when I woke up that morning, I just turned my phone off and, and I just needed like a moment. Like you guys know how it is when one of your favorite classic film or just one of your favorites passes on, you don't know them. And yet you feel like they're a very part of your fabric of, of life somehow. It's just that connection that you have. So that one really, that one really got me. That was, that was Sean Connery was a mom and I and a family and I name. That was, that was a hard one to get through. James Bond only equally matched or equivalent to Pirates of the Caribbean. Those were our main top franchises of interest, though we did have a thing for the Matrix, but that's, that's not a franchise, right? So, okay. But she would have loved John Wick. Like that would have been our jam. Bond, we took seriously, seriously. Both of us being both Sean Connery Bond girls over his predecessors. My mom though, sort of picking back up with Pierce Brosnan as a Bond of interest that caught her attention. But it was Daniel Craig who was unanimous for us as Bond outside Sean Connery. Daniel Craig's Bond was who was responsible for Bond becoming a mom and I franchise again. And we took it seriously as if we were on the board of directors on getting the next Bond film made. <laughs> Advanced screening tickets, one of the firsts in line, dressed up as if we were going to the actual red carpet premiere, playing the original official theme music the day of going to the theater, being on top of what the next new Bond song was, who was singing it, playing that, you know, on the drive to the theater. It was a full production. As was Pirates of the Caribbean, waiting in line, buying shirts and gear to wear to the film release date, staying up late to go to the midnight showing. My mom even making her own POTC tote bag <laughs> to carry with her that received applause from the guys sitting across from us because they wanted her to to show it off to their row, thinking it unique and original. Go big or go home. Which made the release of Spectre bittersweet for me. Because she and I were following closely along with the production as soon as it was announced, already talking about the expectations of what the next Bond film would be when we left the theater from seeing Skyfall. Up until I lost my mom and she had every intention on going to see, to see it when it came out, even talking about it when she was in the hospital. It took me some time at my own pace to finally build up enough strength to watch Spectre for the first time. And even the last Pirates of the Caribbean, though she, she didn't want to see four, she skipped four. I had to watch that on my own, but um, I needed to watch it for myself. Really didn't want company with me to watch them. I needed to be by myself. That may make sense to some of you out there. Got through them and really think she would have enjoyed them both. When I think mom and I films, they are usually always paired with a story behind them, a film memory. As with the cinema coffee pieces I've written so far, amongst many, The Great Gatsby, 2013, History is Made at Night, Portrait of Jenny, the picture of Dorian Gray, or even my most recent write-up a couple of weeks ago, The Search 1948, starring Montgomery Cliff, and countless others I haven't yet written about, particularly those spare-of-the-moment, 
almost midnight moments sitting around the house the day before a planned trip to the movies and my mom making the announcement, you wanna go now? Let's go now. We're not doing anything because it's almost midnight. Though for us being a night owl household, it wasn't uncommon for us to still be dressed or be able to get dressed as if it were 12 o'clock in the afternoon. As is the memory with Public Enemies, the Great Gatsby, but though the Great Gatsby in reverse, like going the morning of instead of the pre-planned trip that we had planned for that night after a round table discussion on the not so kind reviews we were hearing on the news that morn. Always for us wanting to make up our own minds and our own reviews, or even Skyfall with our complimentary tickets. Uh, get dressed, let's go now. I'm, but I'm, I'm working on a project <laughs> in my everyday wear and my mom, flawless, already dressed, full makeup on but my, it doesn't start for another two or three hours. Yeah, I know, but get dressed, let's go now. I don't want any mess on the way there. <laughs> and you get dressed and ready for a girl's night out or a Sunday trip to the movies when you get a knock on the door, still asleep, come in, whoa, you look nice. Where are you going? You wanna go see Nine Now? But I thought we were going tomorrow. I know, but I woke up early and it felt like a movie day. You wanna roll or you wanna go tomorrow? Me trying to Sherlock Holmes ahead to calculate in my mind how quickly I can go from bedhead to cosign my mom's ensemble in a limited amount of time. We went to C9 within the hour, which to our defense, because I often hear even now a lot of slack about the film. We went purely on a Sophia Loren basis, though the dance numbers, wait, <laughs> the dance numbers in the trailers at the time also gave an incentive. My mom and I both preferring eight and a half instead. I don't think it a bad film, even rewatching it recently in prep for today's Cinema Coffee Fashion Friday. I just think you can't remake or adapt Fellini. He, like other filmmakers I could think of, Ingmar Bergman, not to sound cliche, but Alfred Hitchcock, even Jacques Demy, their films are a print specifically for them, if that makes sense. Like what's a Fellini film without Fellini, right? And yes, I know Nine is based on the 1982 musical adaptation in turn, which was based off of Fellini's Eight and a Half, but when watching it, okay, I have this thing when watching a remake or even an adaptation for that matter, like where I turn off all previous versions and focus strictly as if it was a standalone, like an original work, would I still like it? For me, I wish somehow Monica Bellucci or Isabella Rossellini would have made it as a character in mine. I would have loved to have seen Monica as Claudia Jensen, but I'm not a film critic, just a film fan spectator and a cinema conversationalist. Much what my mom and I would do after every film we watch, classic or modern. This was life for me with my mom and I loved it. You couldn't help loving it. Something my dad and I always say, who met my mom when she was 17? Though my dad says she was 16 and that became a debatable subject <laughs> that was all in fun and always humorous to watch them comedically conflict about. She was a grand adventure with every move she made and you wanted to be a part of that. I may have been the boat, but she was Davy Jones. She was the sea. To hear my mom tell others, this is my daughter, she keeps me young, at random moments or when people would hear us joking around going into scene of a film from Gaslight to doing the Charlize Theron J'adore walk down the length of an aisle or a hallway, random, right? Literally while shopping or <laughs> walking out of the grocery store, cue Betty Davis, and people say, are you two sisters? In a complimentary, comical way, that was my badge. I'm with her. I still wear it as long as I live because I'll never stop talking about her. And as you can probably tell, I could go on indefinitely about my mom. It's more than just a conversational piece. It's a story. It's a book. Hmm. Who knows? I do know that's it for this special edition of Cinema Coffee Fashion Friday. Until next Coffee Talk, be safe, be well, stay healthy, stay smart, and I'll see you next time. I'll be in tow. That's right. I'm here. I'm here, though. <laughs>